Well, today uh, being uh, Mother's Day celebrated around the world, we want to wish all uh, mothers uh, a blessed day. And uh, for those of you uh, who are children or uh, husbands to wives who are mothers, uh, we pray that uh, you would uh, give them a good sabbatical day. Uh, don't make them work hard today. Give them an off day. Bless them, take them out or cook for them and uh, uh, treat them with uh, gratefulness and uh, respect. And we bless each one of you mothers. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy upon each of these who are mothers. And we include those who are also spiritual mothers. Uh, we thank you, Father, that you, you put this motherliness in them because you yourself father god contain all the attributes of a mother and we thank you father god that every human positive love expression came from you it is god in us who expresses the best of human emotions and human roles so we ask that you strengthen mothers who have sacrificed themselves we given themselves uh, to bring up their offspring. We know, Father God, when we think about mothers, we think about sacrifice. For every mother has sacrificed. When we think about mothers, we think about uh, unconditional love. Uh, and when we think about mothers, we think about persistence and steadfastness in caring through pain and to time so father we bless these and ask that you establish your work in each life and you cause every seed sown every tear shed to be multiplied in your blessings of grace thank you father we bless you in jesus name <clears throat> amen well we are in this uh, little series on romans eight twenty eight. So let's uh, once again read this uh, little passage uh, which contains such a powerful, transforming uh, verse. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the call according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, he whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. We've been emphasizing for some time now, some weeks now, on how Romans 8, 28 is a very important passage uh, for each one of us to apply. And uh, we have uh, also pointed to the harmony between predestination and free will and how at the end of the day, God wants us to be in His predestined perfect plan. And no matter, and uh, Romans 8, 28 covers uh, free choices that are not so perfect, free choices that are made wrongly, and there is a place to return to God. And here is Romans at 28, that no matter what choices you have made, what uh, uh, mistakes you have made, no matter what consequences you have you found your life in, you can always return to God. Like the prodigal son, uh, no matter what poor choices he has made, no matter that he has uh, uh, squandered, all his inheritance and he has none left when he returned yet the father always has a place for him and he has many friends whom in the end rejected him when he is nothing until when he was in a place where he was taking care of the pigs and when the pig's foot began to look attractive, he knew he was gone. He's so far gone. When, when you look at pig's foot and you envy the pigs, 
you, you must be far gone. And, he, and he's so hungry, he has nothing left in life. Look at it, he has no future. He has uh, no uh, prospect of uh, uh, inheritance anymore. See, he has squandered all. And um, yet he remembers his father. And he remember how good his father has been and how good his father treated his servants while he here is treated badly by whoever master he was serving now and he returned to God. Romans 8, 28 is a place where everyone can return to God. And you ask, well, what about those who cross a line to the unforgivable sin, sin unto death, rejected Jesus? For such people, they wouldn't even think about returning. And if you ever were deceived by the enemy saying you have committed the unforgivable sin, so no point returning to God, you are not the only one in the world. Uh, who feel that way and the, whom the devil made to feel that way. There's a story of John Bunyan and he felt that in those days the theology of some chosen to be saved, some chosen to be lost was uh, very strong, double predestination. Calvinism was in its extreme and he felt that he has committed such sins that God would never take him back. And uh, in the end, after struggling with that, a scripture verse came to him that uh, those who come to God, he will in no way cast out. So he realized, well, if God want to cast him out, we're going to cast him out, but he can come to God. Uh, and of course, God doesn't do that. Like the father who accepted the prodigal son. So Romans 8, 20 covers all our free choices that may be wrong. But it's a, always a road to return. And that's God, who is different from humans. Humans, you either make one mistake and you're gone, or they use the baseball thing, three strikes and you're out. But do you know that's not biblical? Because when uh, Jesus talked about forgiveness, and um, uh, he says 70 times 7, and that's more than three strikes. So it's humans who tend to give up on people not God. And if ever you feel that you're given out on people, that's because you're only human. And I would propose that you get closer to God and let God's unconditional love come into your life. And then you will realize that God never gives up. And then you understand why God never gives up. Because God gives birth to all life. If you were in God's position, you would never give up on your creation, for you made it with all of your, your life. And that's why mothers uh, have such strong, unconditional love for their own children. And um, of course, uh, in a modern age, many uh, mothers who are wrongly taught or deceived by the enemy also do give up on uh, their children. But we're talking about the biblical mother and uh, one who is steadfast and has unconditional love. So this passage in Romans 8, 20 is very important. Uh, since we're teaching on this verse, today we have to touch on the few verses that come before. And the question is asked, is it just coming back to God, is that sufficient? Isn't there something more to this? Are there any conditions to God's accepting us? I think it's unconditional. There are no conditions that someone doesn't cross a line where God's really rejected uh, oneself. But otherwise, this is uh, a very big uh, unconditional love that God has given to mankind. But coming back to God, and being part of working all things out for good is another thing. Although it is God who starts the process, He does love to involve us and people who are intercessors. 
Notice in verse uh, 28, it says, And we know. The task of and we know uh, in this passage seems to point to the fact that we do need to look at the passage before. Um, the word uh, and we know is actually the word uh, a very strong word day which is uh, um, which is uh, stronger than just the normal word N. So it's uh, oidamen dai, which means we know N that oti. So the first three words uh, oidamen dai uh, oti, uh, hoti, uh, is a very strong word that points to the verses before this. And what other verses before this? Verse 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. And that's a true thing. How many of us are intelligent enough to pray 100% of all prayers that we know we should pray? We are not. We know in part, we understand in part, and there's a whole lot that we don't know of the things in the future, even when God reveals His predestination. There's so many details of predestination that uh, we do not know. We might be in a general direction walking with God, but there's so many more details. So how do we approach them? Prayer, apparently, is the key. We do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And of course in the Greek it is according to God. It's God directly being involved. But the word intercession occurs twice. Once in verse 26, once in verse 27. And then he says, And we know that all things work together for good. That places a very high importance to intercessions and to prayers. So let's deal with this theology of prayer and intercession. John Wesley observes that it seems that God does nothing unless prayer is made. For him, there is an observation. And we wrestle with this theological understanding. Is it true that God does not do anything on the planet until intercession is made. And the question is asked, what about God's sovereignty? God is sovereign. He can do whatever He wants. I believe the second question of God being sovereign, where God can do whatever He asks, might not necessarily be in the picture because God is sovereign. He can right now make a lot of things different on this planet. But this planet has gone through various phases of suffering since the creation of mankind such that even unbelievers are skeptical that there is a God because they say, if there is a God, why doesn't He intervene? Where is God? And why are the bad things happening? And so all these thousand and one questions that rise in accusation against our loving Father. So the sovereignty of God 
does not mean that God will violate the laws He has made that operate on this planet. Unless there's an exceptional case, or perhaps unless there's exceptional prayer. It seems that God has led this world run by itself in the physical, such as scientists look at it and say, there is no God, the laws operate on themselves. Which is not true. God could easily uh, amend those laws, such as fire doesn't burn, uh, water can stand up, and, uh, and molecules can be changed from H2O into wine. So there are various things that show that there are, are interventions into the physical world. What about the social world, the spiritual world, where again, there are laws that operate on their own and uh, consequences of wrong choices are allowed to be judged upon oneself, God has to respect the very laws by which He created this planet, whether they be natural laws or spiritual laws. So let's take a little uh, survey here. Despite God's sovereignty, let me rephrase the question, despite God's sovereignty, God will only intervene on the earth when there's intercession and prayer. Is this a true statement? And you can think about it in different ways in your mind. That means nothing happens without prayer on the earth. Uh, whatever God has set in motion, the laws, it will operate <coughs> for things to intervene. Prayer is necessary. And in this question, it also means that God has chosen, despite His sovereignty of omniscience, omnipresence, and omnipotence, to limit Himself in how He intervenes on the earth through Himself and His angels. Is this true? That God has limited Himself to the need for prayer before intervention can take place. It's yes, it's true. No, it's not true. So for those yes, can I see your hand? You can click your little hand there. Let me see where you all stand. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, I see one thing coming up. What about the rest of you? understanding the question, can click the hand that God only works when there's prayer. That means if there's no prayer, He's not going to intervene. <clears throat> uh, okay, Paul has a different opinion. You can put a tick or put a hand there. And uh, Abraham has a different opinion. And a lot of you are saying yes with a hand. Some of you haven't ticked yet or maybe trying to discover your tick. And uh, it's, it's either yes or no. Yes, he has chosen to limit himself that without prayer, nothing will happen. And uh, then if you disagree to that, you can put an X there, a red X. Um, if you agree to that, you can put a green tick or put your hand up. And some of you are still thinking. <clears throat> and it is an important question. It is an important question. Because if it is true that God needs prayer, then all things work together for good because there's intercession and prayer, besides your love for God. If it's not true, then God can actually uh, act without prayer <clears throat> and so after seeing all your ticks and all the things and with the rest of you not sure uh, and sometimes we're going to made up things in our mind and know where to stand in order to relate to god uh, i won't let you know my opinion yet uh wait till you all share your opinion 
And let's see all the dicks and where each one of you are. It's okay, you know, to make mistakes or not to be sure, uh, which is why probably some of you have not responded yet. And um, mm, okay, I can see that. Right. All right, so let's have Abraham defend those who say God doesn't need our prayers. He can just do it. <clears throat> Let me see. I, yes. I think um, uh, he can do it, and he also listened to our prayers. So with prayers, uh, is going to um, uh, expedite, expedite uh, the the the, the thing but without prayer God is not kind of going to sit just idle yeah. okay so let me clarify um, which means that you can take that stand even if 90% of the time God works with prayer and 10% of the time God doesn't use prayer don't need prayer at all and uh, he still intervenes or 99% uh, there's a 1% chance that God intervenes still that is that, that would be the stand whereas the other stand is no, nope. 100% on this earth, he requires prayers before intervention. So, uh, uh, so your stand is, yes, prayers still help, and you include that, but God still will intervene. And for those who say that... Um, uh, he always requires prayers. Uh, and uh, there, there's quite a number of you. And uh, let's see here. Um, hmm. Okay, most of you have uh, done that. Let me take this, click here to see uh, where each one has stand. And okay, right. Let's choose a representation. And um, okay, I see a COG admin. That's uh, Gmail Zoe, right? So you have put no got always this prayer. Now, can you say some words in that line? Defend thyself. Can you hear me, Pastor? Yes, Gmail. Yes. Um, I would say he always needs prayer on this earth because um, he's given us the authority, even like things that are dry cement. Um, there could have been a prayer somewhere, even if um, like even with like with Caiaphas, right? When when Caiaphas said it's good that Jesus dies for the nation. And the Bible says he didn't realize he was prophesying. I mm. believe that God can even use someone to prophesy something. Maybe they don't even realize they're prophesying because the words, God gave us the authority to speak the words into existence. So I think even if the, like, even in situations where the prayer is so small, he still uses that mm. to, to, to bring whatever he needs to on the earth. Okay. Thank you for that. Now, May I ask Abraham to support his position with scriptures and ask Gmail to support your position with scriptures, if you have. <laughs> let's, uh, let's give Abraham a chance. On what basis uh, can he find from Genesis to Revelation? Any verse, uh, if you can't find, that's fine. Uh, any verse that supports a position that uh, he doesn't need our prayers, whether it be 1%, 10%, or whatever percentage. That There are verses that show that God will just do it without prayers. Mm, well, um, uh, the first uh, indirect, indirect, like uh, Bible verses, actually just like uh, Genesis 1, where God created the world and do all the good things. Uh, well, um, let's take it after his creation. Yeah. Okay. 
after his creation, um, from John chapter one was one onward. In the beginning, from the time there was a beginning. Um, because the uh, there, there could be a lot of scenarios where the prayers may not be recorded. So yes. even when I take the Bible verses, it doesn't prove that there hasn't been prayers. Yes. And actually, as for the Trinity, actually Jesus is interceding and Jesus is God. So God prays himself. So that's another kind of... Uh, so that does actually support the other camp. It's kind of uh, that's the the argument. If if God prays Himself and answer His own prayer, then we we uh, then that's the exception to kind of God's sovereignty, and He can do things without uh, prayer from created beings. So I, I guess like um. Uh, because he can pray himself. So if, if the definition is like uh, he he can pray and he answers his own prayer, then then uh, you can also make this this argument that that prayer is needed. But I guess um, because God is sovereign, uh, even the for the created beings they don't pray, God can still work. Yeah. But, okay. uh, yeah, the, uh, I have trouble finding the verses because there could be prayers, you know, behind the scene. Yeah. Yes, unknown. Okay, uh, let's get Gmail. So the best verse I can think of is the Great Commission. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all the authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit teaching them to observe all things that i have commanded you and lo i am with you always even to the end of the age uh, matthew 28 18 to 20 i feel like i believe that he gave us the authority so whatever he wants to do he'll give somebody um somebody uh the a thought or or some kind of impression to speak that word no matter how mm -hmm. great or small so that's mm -hmm. yeah that's that, that's the scripture i would use okay okay well thank you for sharing and uh, on both sides of the argument um as i share my opinion uh Okay, there are some online that talk about those things. I answer the online uh, uh, queries there uh, in the preaching afterward. And it says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless He reveals to His prophets. And that's a good verse, Amos 3 7. Uh, that's a good verse to support the position of God does nothing unless there's prayer. So, okay, before I put my position, uh, I'm actually with a group that. Uh, uh, God has set a law in which prayer is necessary. And uh, one of my first uh, premise, or what I call when you do something, is a preamble. Um, preamble to the doctrine. <clears throat> and why this doctrine is important. You see, when you believe that God uh, does nothing unless it's prayer, it motivates you to pray. To know that that's something you have to contribute. Maybe not yourself, but somebody else somewhere, someplace. And if not, the worst case scenario, Jesus has prayed. And so that's, uh, God sets a law. And when he comes, he has to obey the law. Just like when Jesus came to the earth, he cannot disobey all the laws he wants. When Jesus came to the earth, he has to operate based on the laws that govern the planet Earth. In order to <clears throat> overcome those laws, he has to increase in prayers to overcome those laws. That means Jesus limited himself. And so, hypothetically, we can ask a question. With Satan's rebellion 
and with Adam's and Eve's sin, there is a need of a Savior. The fact that the Savior can do something outside of time or within time, that means whatever is done at any point in time can affect the past, present and future. That is a thought that is important uh, for us to include this doctrine. That means the prayer is just like a credit card. You spend before you pay, but you still have to pay. No matter where or how, it has to be paid, which is why if you operate credit cards, you should be very discerning as to the payment and uh, know that no one escapes payment. Even if you escape payment, someone paid for you, probably. The payment is necessary. Once you spend the credit, payment has to be made, whether by you or somebody else. Even you declare bankrupt, somebody absorbs the payment. So it's still paid. It's still a debit that the company or some place somewhere has absorbed. Uh, the payment is deducted from whatever positive account uh, that is there in the company. And so, um, like Abraham mentioned, I can understand difficulty of the view. It, it's very hard to find scriptures that show God acted sovereignly by himself. Because every action of God after his creation seems to be God showing respect for his own laws and system. Like for example, Jesus could be born on earth only to wear clothes, just use supernatural clothes. Right? There's so many things he could do, but he didn't. He actually wore clothes made by human beings. Um, Jesus can choose not to eat. After all, that's the state that is perfect in heaven. But Jesus ate. So, even when God comes down, he is to obey his own law. Disobedience to your own law shows you're not perfect. And that is something God cannot show. My second preamble point, this is not the real points coming up, but preamble means a foundational point. One is that God has shown throughout history and throughout the Bible, He respects His own laws. In order even to break His own law, He needs another law to operate, which is might be unknown to us, but God knew it exists. Like when He uh, raise, Abra uh, raise Moses up from the dead without Moses going to Hades. Satan protests, but Michael the angel rebuked him. And God was not lawless. Now, when you see that God can break his own law, you're saying God is lawless. So that is the first point that I'm saying. God cannot break his own law. God has to find another law to operate that law, which is what salvation is based on. What's the whole purpose of Jesus dying on the cross? Because God cannot violate his law and allow us to be saved without blood. Where they sin, there must be punishment for sin. And since no one is worthy of the punishment, Jesus must come to accept the punishment. Then we are all free to be saved. So God cannot. So I bring you uh, what I call preamble one. God cannot violate his own laws. If he create anything with laws, to violate it is to break his own law, which means he's no more God. And to operate within his creation, he must respect his own law because let's say it's not fallen yet, his perfect laws that run the thing. So the preamble of God cannot break his own laws is a powerful understanding. Remember, our whole life is to know God, correct? Even when we go to heaven, you still learn about who God is. 
It's just that if you love your spouse, you want to know more about your spouse. If you love someone, you want to know more about them. So we say we love God. Shouldn't we know how God thinks, how God feels, what God does? And I am telling you that every one of us would love God. And many people claim to walk close with God. But do you know the God? It's not knowing about God only, but you know who God is. You know God personally. You know what God is like. And preamble one. I know God never violates or breaks His own law. Even when His law has been corrupted, He has to obey the corrupted laws using higher laws to slowly uncorrupt the corrupted laws. The best example, Jesus dying on the cross for us and living on the earth for 33 years. And I add to, we have to answer all points. And thank you for presenting both view. And, and don't worry, this is just a discussion. is to help us think through. And the purpose of thinking through is for you to know Papa God better. Sub subsidiary to the preamble one that God does not break his own law, in spite of his sovereignty, he will never ever break his own law. It's part of being God. But there's a preamble sub point to this, and that is God doesn't pray to God. God doesn't need prayer. So the correct thing is Jesus is representing mankind. You see, a priest represents his people. A priest can come from any, anywhere. Uh, even Melchizedek, the uh, cherubim, he asked God permission to represent mankind. And until Jesus came, he allowed that. And after Abraham became an intercessor, which sort of uh, Melchizedek, cherub, uh, Adam was supposed to be the intercessor, uh, he didn't do his job well. Melchizedek, the cherub, took on that role after Adam died. And everything was passed on to Abraham. So you see in Abraham's life in the Bible, he was a type of intercessor also. And, um, and so when he says that Jesus made intercessions for us in heaven and on earth, and Jesus, whatever he did, was man for all time, past, present, future. Because God cannot, based on the, pre, the preamble, God cannot break his own law. Then you have preamble two. In order not to break his own law, God has to work out a system when he intervenes where he get the permission to intervene. In the best case scenario, you have the intercessors and the men and women of God in each generation giving permission through their lives for each generation, which God did have. But since all humans are imperfect, God has to have a perfect system written, like a blank check that he gives himself to act on his sovereignty based on God obeying his own laws. His blank check is Jesus. When Jesus came, he redeemed not just mankind. Jesus came, his redemption spread to the salvation and acceptance of all angels in the angelic age. And Jesus' blood covered the word the first atom that was created at the beginning to the last atom that is renovated into new heaven, new earth. The blood of Jesus Christ. And, and here is where I encourage you to take this view, which is very biblical, I support with more scriptures afterwards. It's because it makes you appreciate Jesus more. And the understanding why we have to pray in Jesus' name. Why God, and I can show, when Philippians 2, when Jesus 
went into the heavens and sit at the right hand of God. Remember what God did, something that changed all heaven. The Father God, our Papa God proclaimed, let all creation bow to the name of Jesus. Because before that, they were bowing to the name of God, which is not fully revealed. Let all creation bow to the name of Jesus. From angels to the 24 elders, which you see them do in the book of Revelations, to all worlds and galaxies in the universe, let all bow to Jesus. Why was God doing that? Because God, through Jesus, was giving himself a blank check to Jesus, who died as a man. Though he contained the fullness of God revealed in him, his blood, and he died not just as a man, as the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. You see, the blood of the Lamb, not just blood of Jesus, is the blood that gives the God who, number one, cannot break his own law. And when angels break his law, human break his law, and any other planets that break his law, he's bound to obey the laws, even the broken laws that still operate, and he cannot just rush in. He has to respect his own law and show to his creation that his own laws are so perfect that when he comes in to any world that has any other law operating, he must respect those laws that he himself has got created. Because if he ever break his law and, and make it better, it shows that his original creation was not good enough. And he as God, God A is not good as God B, who could uh, uh, improve on God A. The word improve can never be used of God. <clears throat> From day one, he's perfect. So the preamble that God cannot break his own law need a preamble too. That God need to somehow give himself the permission to intervene because otherwise the whole universe will be corrupted if he doesn't intervene at times or the whole planet Earth as in Noah's time nearly destroyed itself. The blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb. And you know any true knowledge of God will make you love God more. And this knowledge will make you love God more. And if this knowledge is absorbed by you, remember we are made in the image of God, nature of God. Which means that, which is God's commandment to us, you cannot break your own laws that you create. Otherwise you're a hypocrite, which is a double sin. So that we as humans, when we carry out our work, and our principles. We must find a way in which we obey our own laws. Let's say a government or a country. If a country keeps changing their laws each time and, and, and remove their old law and replace it, the whole country will collapse. But a country that respects its own law and its own principles will greatly be respected by other countries. And put that to a person. A person who respects his own, uh, respects the laws of God and his own laws that he make in view of God's laws and his principles, who does not break his own principles, break his own laws, is a person that is easier to trust and easier to relate. There's someone who keeps changing all the time. Tomorrow you come, or oh, we operate a different law. And then tomorrow you come, red light is go, uh, yellow light is, uh, is stop, and green light is, uh, is to wait. Then the next day, oh, green light is go, yellow, yellow light is to be alert to stop, and red light is to stop. How are you going to drive your car if every day the laws change? And then the next day, we change the red light to purple light. Do you know what a confusing world it will be if God behaves that way? And you say, I am the dictator. 
I have all three authorities, legislative power, executive power, and you are like a, a, a ruler over everything. You can make your own laws. You think people want to live in your country? The people who live there are so confused. Every day they check, okay, what is the law today? No. You can see how impractical it is if you give a dictator permission to intervene whenever he wants. Then we ask a question. If he has to intervene now, doesn't that show that in the past he didn't do it rightly? Why he might improve if he was so good? And that's the question we can ask God if he has to keep intervening. You can see you open a Pandora's box of the imperfection of God if there's such a doctrine. Is there a doctrine imperfection of God? No. That's what the devil tried to show. You know what the devil say? Oh, God just don't want you to be like that. Don't you to be like him. Isn't that the imperfection of God's doctrine from the devil? So you cannot run a country if you use your sovereignty to break the law or to intervene wherever you want. And you cannot trust or even relate properly to a person who constantly use sovereignty to change their mind. You can't. So on the microscopic scale or on the mega scale or the macro scale, God cannot break his own law because his original first statement is the best of the best of the best. You cannot improve it because God is perfect. And God has to anticipate every possibility of breaking that law. But preamble to, he has given himself that permission through the lambs of God, the lamb of God's blood. And when the lamb shed his blood, not just as a man, but as a lamb of God for the whole universe, it was to cover the permission of God from the beginning to the end. Which means that the lamb has to be the perfect picture of prayer and intercession if his prayer is what it's about. Which the Bible show. Preamble 2 is supported by the Bible in the book of... And after today, you can say, you know God a little bit better. You see, when I look at a God who does not violate his own laws, it makes me a better person. Because who you see is who you become. Then I see that, just as... You know, God's word is so powerful, that the Bible in the book of Romans say, God swore by two things that cannot be changed. Remember in Romans 4. He swore to Abraham by himself, which cannot change. Yesterday, today, forever, God is the same. And he swore by his own words, which he never changed. And when I look at a God who respects his own laws, it makes me a person who respects my own laws and principles. And if I keep looking at a God who can change his mind, then it will make me a wishy-washy person. And of course, the most important is, when you know God intimately, you will discover this. So all this, as I say, come from my personal relationship with God and my understanding of who God is. And when, when a person say, let's say, you know, uh, let's say, uh, Abraham, you know, I use it as an example, uh, who knows you best? Probably your father, mother, probably your wife, your spouse, probably your children, and then your friends, and uh, co-workers, and we are, uh, partners in the ministry, so I would know you also to a certain extent. But the person who knows you best is God. Um, 
And if those of you online, all you know is Abraham by name. You probably know him, but don't fully know him. Correct? So we ask, who knows him best? Probably people who live 24 hours with him. And, and have seen him from baby to uh, adulthood. And I can appreciate your sharing about your mom. I uh, didn't have her as a mom, but I have encounter your mom and she's definitely a very generous woman a godly woman and i salute her and praise god for her she's doing well in heaven uh, she's getting ready to receive your father in heaven and um, <clears throat> so uh, there's a preparation in heaven she's quite patient she's been waiting been helping different things she's waiting to help in the training or spiritualization, if I can use the word, of your father when he meets her, when his work on earth is done and he goes home. So <clears throat> there we have it. And in this life, and remember I said, my goal in life is to be the man of course, together with my spouse, with one, to know God closest more than any human being on earth. Because I have that goal, I seek to know God, and I, and I know that this is what God is like. Though He has sovereignty, He never violates His, his creation and His laws without prayers and intercession. And Jesus the Lamb has provided that. So Jesus the Lamb has actually lived that life and show forth that life. So I give you Hebrews. In Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, reference to Jesus, who is a high priest. Who in the days of his flesh, now his flesh emphasized he, is, he came as a man and as a lamb of God. He's not here as God praying to God. He is the lamb praying to God. When he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries, and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So you have here a word talking about Jesus praying on the earth. And everything that Jesus did, that Jesus harvested, miracles, signs, wonders, or life close with God, 100% of it came because of his own prayers. So if we could pray like Jesus, remember early morning, you know, he, he got up, the Gospel of Mark show, the disciples looked for him, cannot find him in the house found that he has gone to the wilderness early in the morning to pray. Sometimes he go all night to pray, like in the Gospel of Luke. So Jesus had to pray because of this law that says, which we are now debating, nothing happens without prayer. Prayer is necessary by someone, someplace, somewhere. Not necessarily by the person who needs the prayer most. So here you have in uh, chapter 7, verse 25 of Hebrews. Even when he went up to heaven, it says, But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he also is also able to save, now remember, save to the uttermost. That means not just normal salvation, 
everything you're safe from poverty, sickness, disease, and imperfection that is not part of God's perfect will. We are safe from all the things that are outside God's will. To the uttermost, those who come to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. There you have it. And remember the incident when he's talking to Peter and he says, Simon, Simon, Satan wants you. But I have prayed for you. Now what happened if Jesus didn't pray? Probably you lose Simon. But Jesus prayed and because of his prayer, Peter's free will was touched and he was brought back. So in answer to one of the chat questions that Romans 8, 28 is based on love, not on prayer requests, that is depend on how you see it. If you see it from an end point of view, yes. But you can see that it's still based on love. Because Jesus loves us so much, He even prayed for us when we cannot pray. He even covered us in prayer when we are too weak to pray. And then the day comes when we can pray, then we join Him in His work. So it's still based on love. He loves us so much that we cannot pray, and if all things are based on prayer requests, from an end point of view, you say, hey, no fail. But then when you see that preamble too, God, through the Lamb, has in a sense prayed for all of us. And any intercession, you know, I mean, God is God. How can He trust human beings with His predestination? We will all falter and fail, and it will be a second Noah's flood or fire. How can God trust His angels? One third also fall. How can God trust His creation? Not that we are not worthy. We potentially could be, but we are not perfect. We are on the way to perfection. So God trusts the Lamb of God. Jesus manifest in the flesh and committed to Him all the prayers to pray for us, for the universe, for the angels in their work. Wow, now, you know what it makes you and I? It makes us love Jesus more. Correct? Not only did He die for our sins, not only did He die for our, our needs, but He died and He came and lived to pray for us. Yes, even those of us who were not born or didn't exist physically on the earth at his time in 33 years on earth. Doesn't it make a, you a love Jesus and appreciate Jesus more? And that's what truth does. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And truth, if it is truth, <clears throat> will make you love God more and make you love Jesus more. So you can see why this doctrine is important. So I answered the first Jack question. On the second uh, contribution for family, Amos 3.7, that he, he reviews to his prophet, they support the preposition that before God does something, he wants to invoke prayer. And that's why he, uh, that verse is given to support that. And uh, then uh, Mina shared uh, uh, Hebrews 5.7-10, yes, Thank you, Mina. You, you got a scriptures that show Jesus was praying. You know why? Do you know? And here's, here's the side principle. You know when you got one main principle, there are a lot of side principles coming from that one. That means if Jesus failed in prayers, he would have failed. Doesn't that give an importance to prayer? Now, what happens to us? How does it change us with this more perfect doctrine? It makes you want to pray. Not just for ourselves, 
But for anybody else who needs that prayer, that God can use us. And there I will teach more afterwards. Uh, on, 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 there are two stages in our life. Let's not measure our life by whether you're saved or not saved and, and other things. But let's measure our life from heaven. There are two stages. You're either someone who needs, since, since preamble one, God doesn't violate his own laws. Because when he created his laws, they were already perfect, cannot be improved upon. Even when they're broken, they're still powerful. Number two, since God needs permission to intervene on behalf of his creation, he has provided himself the blood of the Lamb that gives him permission to intervene on the earth, past, present, future. Because the Lamb's death was past, present, and future. Now you know why the Lamb is at the foundation, before the foundation of the world. Okay, if I ask you a question, why was a lamb slain before the foundation of the earth? You got no answer except, well, it's it just, it just the fact. Now you know why. Today you learn why. That at whatever point Jesus came in the timeline, he must bring it into the timeless realm. He must ascend into the place where he's outside of time. So that all of time, past, present, and future, is contained under his blood. You see, when you learn that Jesus died for your sins, you only know a bit of Jesus. When you know that Jesus died for the universe, and by his blood, God continued to work based on his principles in the universe, wherever his universe is not perfect enough, might not have fallen, but not perfect enough. Even the pristine universe became more perfect after the blood of the Lamb came in. Even the pristine universe that never fell, when it contacted the blood, it became more perfect and beautiful. So after Jesus died inside time, at a point on this earth, he ascended to the throne of God, which is outside of time. And his blood covered all the timeline and all creation. And that is why when we see from our time sphere, looking to the timeless realm, we see the Lamb of God outside of time because He's redeeming all time. Remember the Bible got such a word, redeeming time? Even time needs to be redeemed because time was not flowing perfectly. It has too many uh, sidetracks. So God has to redeem time. Not just redeem us, redeem the universe, redeem time, redeem space, redeem everything. And so the Lamb of God who came inside the timeline, came out of the timeline and remained next to God as the permission to intervene on the earth. And from the, before the foundation of the world, it's already said and done. And that shows how important prayer and intercession is. There are two ways, two, uh, two stages of walking with God. One, you're a person who needs all the intercession and prayer for yourself. Two, when you become like God, and you join Jesus in being the universal intercessor. Of course, in between one and two are the process, where we partly still need prayer, partly still functioning prayer for others. Right? So you got, uh, what position should I call that? You're the one to two. So you have the integral between 1.1 to 2. And that's important because the day you reach two, where everything you need to be prayed for in your life has been prayed, and now all your prayers are used to join the work of Jesus in praying for all his creation to be perfect. Hallelujah 
handshake, you have you have become a son of God. All your needs are already met in Christ. And hallelujah, handshake, you have entered into the priesthood of Melchizedek. So are you a baby priest, still learning, being trained? Or are you a full-fledged priest under the order of Jesus, the priesthood of Melchizedek? Can you see the progress now? And can you see that the more you understand that Jesus has met all your needs, the more you understand you can give your life in prayers like Jesus did to his creation. So don't forget, Hebrews 7, Jesus did that. No wonder Jesus' life is so special. Jesus, even though he was born of the tribe of Judah, he was functioning in type as a priesthood of Melchizedek. That began even before Aaron's priesthood. Aaron's priesthood, and, it, and here's the difference. The priesthood of Melchizedek, even in the book of Psalms, is a priesthood that, that has completed its work. It's, a, it's, it's there when Abraham got his victory, Melchizedek met him. And uh, David sang about Melchizedek because uh, it's a victory. It, it's, it's, it's already done. The priesthood of Aaron, which is under the law, was more a priesthood to meet the needs of people who keep falling, who keep falling, who keep falling. It's a priesthood of, uh, uh, we could say, repairing. Repairing what needs to be repaired and uh, giving forgiveness for where sin, they keep falling to sin and they need the blood, until the blood of the Lamb come to be slain once. And the priesthood of Melchizedek perfect that. He gives you the energy and the born again experience. He write the laws in your heart, in your mind, so that you will never fall again, so that you become like Jesus. <clears throat> the priesthood of Aaron, brings you forgiveness of sins. The priesthood of Melchizedek makes you into a priest like Jesus where you can release forgiveness. And he says, whomever you forgive is forgiven. Whomever you hold against that is hell. So your authority has increased. What a different realm. Now, having supported that, with scriptures, let me point to the importance of prayers and intercessions, even in the Bible. And um, how powerful intercession is, is here that uh, when God, since God always worked by intercession for all things, in an area of judgment where God does not want to do anything anymore, you know what God does? He asks you, don't pray. Now, why should God ask us not to pray? Which he did. 1 John chapter 5. See, I'm supporting the doctrine of why everything is based on prayer. And when an area where God says, you know, uh, uh, I've judged this, I don't want you to change anything there, God says, don't pray. Wow, God asks us don't pray. Most of the time he says, pray. Well, there are verses that tell you not to pray. First John. Now, how can we understand these verses like that? Without the doctrine that all things are done because of prayer. So God doesn't want to do anything more than don't pray on that. Foo, foo, foo. In first John chapter 5, in verse 16. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. That means pray for them. There is a sin leading to death, what John says, the apostle of love. I do not say that he should pray about that. That means don't pray. Oh. 
And in the experience, besides scripture, in the experience of Charles G. Finney, who was quite a powerful intercessor, besides being a powerful evangelist, they are sometimes he pray, 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 then God says, I don't want you to pray here anymore because the person had crossed the line. Wow. Prayer is so powerful. And let me see uh, the last writing on chat. Uh, Psalms 46 verse 10, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted on earth. You say, be me, you should stop striving, but be patient, become trust in Him. Yes, thank you. Well, I have look at all your chat queries in line with the um, uh, our understanding of doctrine. Today, my friends, you know God better. My brethren, beloved, you can know God better and know who God is. Now, when he asks people not to pray, it's because he knows prayer is powerful. And based on his principle, it has to act based on the prayer. Two ways. God does nothing unless there's prayer. And then the opposite version of the principle is, where there's prayer, God will do something. Can you see the two, two equations are the same? God does nothing unless there's prayer. Where there's prayer, God does something. It's a powerful principle. And the devil would like us not to believe this because he wants people to be prayerless. And now you know why Jesus prayed all the time and why Paul said, Pray without ceasing. Now you know why. And then in verses like this, beside 1 John 5, you have uh, interesting, funny verses like this one in uh, Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 16. Therefore, do not pray for these people. Huh? Hey, Bible. Therefore, do not pray for these people. Not live up a cry or prayer for them. No make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. So don't pray. Ha! Because God does nothing except by prayer. And because true prayers will bring about some sort of action and intervention. Mm. And uh, so it says here in uh, prophecy about Jesus, how he is the perfect lamb. He is the personification of all intercessions. Which is an important doctrine because, I better mention it now, afterward I will share that all true prayers actually flow to Jesus' intercession, which is flow to the Holy Spirit. Why you think you and I so clever can pray? Even our best prayer came from Him. That's why we can salute Jesus even more. Thank you, Jesus. Why do you think you're also clever? We're also clever. And all the intercessions are clever. From, from, from the time that the first human intercession came until the last one that exists in the end time. You think we're so clever? Let's humble ourselves more. We are not clever enough to pray. <laughs> we are not even strong enough to pray. We need the strength of the energy of Jesus' intercession to flow through us. So now you begin to see Romans 8 very differently. Because before, if you read Romans 8, 26 to 28, like an end, you would think that the prayer is us praying. No! Even verse 26, 27, Romans 8 says, that's not us. There was a Holy Spirit praying through us. And there is, and here's the thing, it shows how fallen we are. Every single successful intercessor of prayer, prayer, uh, or even like Aphroditus, who almost died in his intercession and, and gave himself to intercession, or Anna, the prophetess, who gave a life to spend with God in intercession. All of them were praying through the spirit of prayer and not by themselves. Hmm. That makes it a better picture, doesn't it? 
And uh, so here in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death, <coughs> and he was numbered with the transgressions, he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. So here it is not just talking about Jesus on the cross, looking down at all the people in his generation and say, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they have done. It is not just talking about Jesus praying for the people who crucified him and went against him in his generation, his time. It is he offered up intercession for everyone who broke any law. The word transgressors instead of sinners in the Hebrew in chapter uh, Hebrew 53 12. Transgressors mean lawbreakers. That's a literal translation. So any law that was broken from the creation time to the end of all time, within past, present, future, Jesus made intercession for all. He was the perfect intercession for us. And that is why uh, even Paul, when he and, uh, tells us you know, about that, he says here in uh, 1 Timothy 2.1, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplication prayers, intercessions and giving and thanks be made for all men. And then you have verses like uh, Romans. Let's do a Romans again. Now you see the word intercession used in verse 26, 27, 34. Verse 26 of Romans 8. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses, our imperfection. You know, if you pray without the name of Jesus, you're like praying based on your own self. But when you pray based on the name of Jesus, you're saying, I'm praying through the intercession of Jesus. He has enabled me to pray. And I'm praying based on everything Jesus has done, not what I have done. For there's none righteous. It says, for we do not know what we should pray as we ought. But the Spirit Himself makes intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered and that can include tongues which is even higher when you don't even know what you're praying but the holy spirit using you praying and praying and praying that is why i always encourage length of time in prayers now you know why i, I push everyone to pray five hours every friday because and now five hours worship which is good because when you spend even one all night a week, you create a surplus credit of prayers that you ever need. Some of you might experience it. When you spend one day a week in prayer, it's like your all night prayer, there are certain presence of God that come on your life that carry you throughout the whole week. And when you're very prayed up, it's like you can wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning and say, Thus says the Lord, be healed. Because you really pray up. You don't need to wake up at 3 a.m. and say, oh, Wait, 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 I need to spend four hours uh, before I can pray for you. No, because you're prayed up. And so please increase your prayer, your prayer life, and your worship life. Build much credit. Since the law of God is, nothing happens without prayer. Prayer is needed for God's intercession. But even here is not our prayers. It says, Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to God, the will of God. Then verse 34, same chapter. In one chapter, you have three verses emphasizing intercession. The priesthood of Melchizedek. Verse 34, 
Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Now you know what is happening. There's a part of the Godhead of Christ, the Lamb of God, the human part, that is praying even, and it will push outside of the time barrier into eternity outside of time, before the foundation of the world and after the foundation of the world and all the completion of the world, there is that intercession of the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. Now you know the answer why <clears throat> the lamb of god has to be outside of time to redeem time and all that time contains now let me establish these other words here besides the intercession and you see here that the prayers of the saints is something that even heaven treasures. Let's look here at the um, book of Revelations. And you see these containers in uh, Revelation 5, verse 8. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, you see, when Jesus took the scroll, it is to release the next event. And then need the blood of the Lamb and intercession into the timeline, which for us is a future timeline and the future after Jesus rose from the dead. The four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb each having a harp and golden bowls of full of incense. And what is the incense? Now, incense here, talk about something that is fragrant. It is fragrant. I assume that many women put perfume. Some men also use perfume. Uh, for me, uh, I, I don't use men's perfume at all. I just make sure when I bath, I have a good clean bath, that's it. And, um, but incense is something added. And the incense in heaven, which are, that means 100% of the incense, are the prayers of the saints. You know, heaven can do nothing except through prayers. What a powerful doctrine. And you understand. And then, to those who feel unworthy of prayer, un unable to pray, they feel, I'm not fair, I cannot pray. Then when you understand the fact that Jesus has done all the prayer for you, you say, ah, ah, okay, okay, sorry for my misunderstanding. Yay. So, the prayers of the saints are perfume. Now, a good offering, given in the right heart and given in God, is also Incense. Philippians chapter 4 talks about the offering is like a sweet smell to God. You know, money by itself, except new money, it has a more cleaner smell. But money in itself, paper money, physical money, doesn't smell good. But it's the spirit behind it. And nowadays, you know, everything is in digits and uh, it's, it's cashless society. But Every time you and I gave a good tithe, a good offering, we are producing incense to God. Oh, how beautiful it is. And prayers included. And even when God has to do extra judgment for all the broken laws on earth, again, is the prayers of the saints. Remember, this is incense. And look at Revelation 8, verse 3. Then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense. The more, the better. 
That's why even if you have prayed for your whole life, until you got enough prayers for yourself, for your life from uh, one year old to 120 years old, don't stop. You can contribute to this vast collection of prayers for the sake of other people, for the redemption of time, human beings, animals, plants, the planet Earth, the whole galaxy, galaxies, whole universe, join in God. It says, another angel having a golden incense came and stood at all, that he was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which was before God, and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. So there was some sort of fragrance that was already in God, and the fragrance of incense of the saints was added to that, just like uh, uh, the Holy of Holies. Wow, powerful. Imagine that. And then um, uh, all these uh, verses uh, point to this um, uh, wonderful fact about uh, the importance of prayer. There is there. See, I have a touch on prayers are so powerful, important, that God says, don't pray because it doesn't change those things anymore. And that's so funny, but yeah, interesting. And then Look at all the powers of prayer. And, and you look at so many examples of prayer. Daniel was a man of prayer. Paul was a man of prayer. In every verse, every uh, episode, he said, I'm praying for you, I'm praying for this. Epaphroditus was a man of prayer. Men and women of prayer. And Abraham was a man of prayer. Moses was a man of prayer. Men and women of prayer through the Bible have always in the end lived perfect lives in the sight of God. David was a man of prayer and of worship. Can you name anyone in the Bible who reached to such a degree of their walk with God despite their failing that God used them as an example? Abraham is quoted. Noah was quoted. David is quoted. Daniel was quoted. But to the men and women who don't pray much, Samson, not much is mentioned of their life. Gideon, not much is mentioned. I mean, they, they had some redemption. They were among the heroes of faith. But God wanted to take the best of the best of the best and bring it forth. So we return back to Romans 8, 28. And we can clarify what this verse means. In verse 28, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the call according to His purpose. Condition upon intercessions that flow from Jesus, the Lamb of God, and that flow to every intercessor God could find and use on earth, and if possible, that can flow through us, because Paul said, even we groan. So when you see that prayer is necessary to Romans 8, 28, and that the prayers came as a gift from Jesus, our intercessor, then you have no problem with verse 28, including the condition of prayers. Because Jesus has done all our prayer. That's number one. Number two, every prayer that has ever been prayed has been from the Spirit and from Jesus. It's not born of man. What is born of the flesh is the flesh. What is born of the Spirit is spirit. So true prayers, whether it be from Ananias, uh, from, from, from Anna the prophetess, or it be from Daniel, it be from anyone, it was the Spirit stirring them to pray. All the prayers of Daniel has been stirred inside it. So that's why point two, when you see that it's through Jesus anyway, 
And Jesus will find someone, some place to do it. And let me tell this true story. I have a book. Uh, I forgot the book title now. <laughs> uh, and it talked about this guy who is praying in tongues a lot. And uh, he was in a church prayer room. And uh, a Hebrew scholar was visiting this pastor. And as he passed by the place, he says, what's that? sound coming from. He said, oh, those are the intercessors praying. Then the Hebrew scholar came near and said, uh, do they know what they're doing? He said, no, they're praying in tongues. And the Hebrew scholar said, one of them is praying in Hebrew. And in Hebrew, he's calling angels by name and telling them where to go. And he's praying for people all over the place, some widows and some orphans, and some, he's calling angels to go to them. Wow. Think what happens when you pray in tongues. And he says, who is this man? Does he know Hebrew? He says, no. He's actually uh, like a blue-collar worker, a laborer, and uh, didn't even receive much education. But he says, he's praying fluently in ancient Hebrew. Ooh. My third point is this. Remember from heaven, the angels and God, since all things are based on prayer, and all things are based on the prayers or intercession from the Lamb of God. And then we say, see, now we understand that. And when you look for heaven's perspective, let's enter point three. Become a priest of the order of Melchizedek. Don't just be someone who is needy in prayer. Pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. Be someone who actually know how to pray for themselves. And of course, God will cover you, but who learns how to pray for others. And then we shake hands, you enter the priesthood of Melchizedek, full flesh. You become a son of God, not just a baby in the Lord. Romans 8 talks about sonship. He does. And in his talk about sonship, he says in verse 23, Romans said, not only that, but we also who are the first fruits of the Spirit. So the first fruit of the Spirit is working in you. And you know first fruits is just the beginning of harvest. The first ripe tomato, first ripe durian, first ripe rambutan, the first ripe apple or oranges. You know, when I get a piece of land, I'm going to plant fruit trees. Um, which I did once. Uh, in origin in Canberra, when we were there, I planted cherries, mandarin, orange. I see them growing, and I only got a chance to taste the cherries, and they were delicious from the tree. First fruits is the first beginning fruit of a tree. That means the tree must be full blossom. Today, we are living in an end time. 2,000 years of Christianity have been absorbed into us. All the beautiful, wonderful doctrines and principles and spiritual law discovered by men and women of God through the ages are flowing through our veins and arteries. Today, we can be perfected and bear abundant fruit, not just first fruit. Today, we have become sons and daughters of God. The end time is the perfection of the church, the establishment of the kingdom of God. It all began in prayer and it ends in the fullness of prayer. For we know, it says in verse 27, that the whole creation groans. We also groan. And it says, verse 23, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. This groaning is a prayer, is the first fruits of the Spirit. See, it's, the prayer is not born of us, it's born from Jesus. It is Jesus interceding through us. 
and He find our voice, our mind, our body, and pray through us. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Sons of God. The final part is, as we enter into this spirit of prayer, even as our bodies begin to pray, we become transfigured. Even our body is changed. First, our spirit was born again. We got the first fruit of the spirit. Then the spirit teaches to pray. Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14 15 says, When I pray in my spirit, when I pray in tongues, my spirit pray. And then our soul also get caught up to learn how to pray. And then our body get caught up. It's the flow of this intercession, incense, and flow through us until we become the incense of God. We become the living, breathing temple of God. We become the third temple that God is building on earth. Then the work is complete. How beautiful it is when you see this doctrine and understand that our prayers are the incense that God light in our spirit, soul, and body. And we enter the fullness of the kingdom of God, the transfiguration. You have a new earth. Amen. Father, let this be upon us. Cause us not to just be recipients of prayer. Cause us to be vessels that bring forth prayers to this planet, to this universe. Join us with Jesus, the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the earth, interceding for the universe. Until this heaven and earth, this present heaven and earth, is changed into new heaven, new earth, to the release of the intercession of the Lamb of God, to the blood of the Lamb, praying through each one of us, releasing such energy that this universe is changed to a new heaven, new world. Let it be unto us according to your word, in Jesus' name. And uh, let's a q and A. I I pass it to Abraham, uh, coordinating today. Hmm. Okay, so uh, if you have any question for uh, Pastor, relating to today's topic, um, you can you can just unmute and ask the question, or you can also type your questions in the chat in the chat room. So, while uh, the question coming, Abraham, your comments have I brought you um, this understanding now? You be one of those to lift up your hands. Oh yeah, uh, actually we are uh, very very convinced uh, that prayer is very important and it works all things, yeah. So uh, I guess uh, uh, the, importance, the importance is really to, to really grasp this, this fact and uh, be um, uh, very uh, persevere uh, in our prayer. Mm. So yeah, any, anyone has uh, any question or comment? Hi, Pastor. Yeah. Hi, Femi. Uh, thank you for the wonderful teaching. Um, as you were teaching, and uh, you mentioned that there are times God says, don't ask me, don't pray. <laughs> I was running my mind through various places in the Bible. And uh, the story of David and uh, when his son was killed, as judgments came to my mind, <clears throat> when Moses was asking God for that kind of, please let me go into the promised land. God said, don't ask me. <laughs> so I, I wondered, is it that, um, because you've also taught us that uh, through those prayers, those seven days, Solomon came out of that. So, and he wasn't praying in tongues. I would imagine he was praying in understanding, asking, save my son, save my son. Is it that God took his desire and uh, just, turn the prayer into something else instead of uh, answering it or telling him, don't ask me. And uh, is it possible, if that is true, that sometimes people praying in understanding 
God just supersedes uh, what they're asking for and uses those prayers to bring forth something even better. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, it's the mercy of God. Uh, sometimes prayer, remember I mentioned that prayer is not from us, it's from God. And when the seed of that prayer is lodged into us through the spirit of intercession, it just has to come out. And when we are limited in understanding, sometimes it comes out in a tear. Remember, and sometimes it comes out voiceless, like Hannah. Hannah suffered so long and all the things. In the end, it's only when it comes out from her, bang, she got the answer. Not a word came out. It's just like a desire. And, and David really wanted that child not to be lost. But God gave him another one in the end. And uh, in the Old Testament, when you see them pray, they didn't repeat it over and over again, like begging or nagging. No, it's not begging or nagging. I mean, imagine nagging, nagging God, as if God can be nagged. He can pick it will cease to exist. But it's more like they utter their desire, then they're quiet. They're just waiting on God. And uh, like Moses lying down for 40 days and 40 nights interceding for the uh, Israelite silence. But it's like a position prayer. So I haven't thought much on that yet, but one day we can teach more. We already got so many prayer series. Uh, so I didn't talk how to do it today. I just talked the doctrine of it. But there is a way you pray, you position yourself. I'm not letting this prayer go in un unspoken words. Just pray. And, and many times you can pray through. And many times you can do your thing, then come back and take that position. When it's a long thing that you desire uh, from God, that takes time to answer. Uh, but it is good, in my opinion, in answer to your question, when you ask whether you can pray, then God says no or don't ask. It is actually a good thing to pray, uh, not purposely until God says no, but I say no harm done. No harm done for Moses to pray. And say, every time he do something, he say, God, can I go in? And then, hey, God, you say I cannot go in. Please, can I go in? No harm done. God didn't like smite Moses and then he died spiritual and body now. God, God actually enjoys that. He enjoys our little childlike persistence. And it's through these things that we develop what I call the ability to be persistent. And persistence in prayer is one of the qualities that get prayers answered. People who don't give up easily. Amen. Now, let's see. Uh, the question here. Hello, good morning, sir. I want to ask, can we pray stop a war? I mean, completely stop a war. Not even a bullet could be fired again. Good question. The answer, yes. Yes. So, uh, it is possible to pray until peace comes. Uh, to stop a war with prayers. Uh, next. Thank you for explaining that God cannot do anything except on prayer. Somehow I also thought that prayer enhanced what God can do or acts as a catalyst since God is all sovereign. I concur with Pastor Abraham at first based on Genesis 1 verse 1 like he mentioned. However, you explained that the question is being on after God's creation and the law he has said yes. Now, does the rule or law explain the cause and effect of problems in the world? such that the problems are pre pre present in the world today due to the lack of prayers on earth? Let me answer this first. The problems on earth are not just due to the lack of prayers. They're due to broken laws. Do you know how much negative words are spoken in a country or in a community? How much curses are spoken? And the law operates in reverse. Instead of the same law operating for you, it operate against you. So I again I say this. Just like you see, all things happen because of prayer and need prayer. 
all the evil things and that has fallen on any nation has been the result of broken laws. In fact, this is where people should not blame God. They should put a giant mirror and look at themselves. Because I, I make this fact again, and I know it's true in the spirit, but very hard to prove on earth. Every accident, evil, a disaster, famine that has happened on earth, all the evil that has caused human suffering has been because the humans have operated the law negatively against themselves. When King Saul broke the law with the Kibionites, David suffered a famine. Every evil that has happened on earth was given permission. In other words, Satan himself knew this law. And he get people to pray negatively. But they didn't actually pray. They just speak and they want it. To desire is also a prayer. So when they speak negative, it's all collected and brought evil on the people. When people curse themselves, they curse each other. When people curse God, when they open to the devil, when they desire bad things to happen, when they hate one another, is Satan tapping on the law of prayer in reverse to bring evil. In other words, Satan can do nothing on the earth unless human beings give permission. Wow. Right, I've answered that answer. Uh, it's not so much a lack of prayer, it's humans giving permission to Satan. Next, during the week I was thinking to myself that the major problems that are happening in my country, South Africa, is due to lack of prayers on the saints or body of Christ. Is that so? Partly so. It's part of the picture. It's just like one day God told Kenneth Hagin uh, and God spoke to him in such a way that it looked like uh, the, church, the, the church and Christians are to blame for what happened in the country. Then Hagin said, why? Well, why is it our responsibility? Is this people's choice? And he says, because the church did not pray. Lack of prayers. But the other side is, the unbelievers are quote-unquote praying and wishing and desiring all the bad things and they're operating the law of God negatively upon themselves. And then it's just like a person, no very negative person, bah, 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 bah. one day they fall sick because of their own negative thing, then they blame God. And God is not responsible. God showed them the mirror and said, actually, all these things you're suffering, you brought upon yourself. And that is the truth. Because the law is the law. If God cannot operate anything unless it's prayer, and he create a blank check through the blood of the lamb. Satan couldn't do that. So Satan is trying to do it through his uh, slaves uh, to get them to say the wrong thing, to get them to do the wrong thing, and that give him permission to bring even more evil. Interesting, right? The law operates on both sides, God's side and on the devil's side. Next question, Pastor, can you please clarify, if Jesus is continuously interceding for us, why does he need to intercede through us? Good question, uh, uh, Eliza, good question. And um, the reason is he wants to give us the, partly the reward of the answer. See, if we are recipients, that's it. But when he can use us, when he can use us, he brings us into another level. Another level to reward us. And uh, I will sh read that verse again that I read earlier to show that there is a hidden reward when he can pray through us. If he can find any humans to pray through, remember how we have been created in the image of God? When we do that, the image of God gets embossed into our life and engraved. So because Moses, do you know Moses? He was a powerful intercessor and something changed in him. A godliness was imparted. 
same with Abraham, same with Daniel. And um, let me read these verses again. And uh, let's see. Here in Hebrews 7.25, verse 20, uh, about priests and priesthood, verse 23. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Uh, Hebrews 7, verse 25, Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost. The word uttermost in Hebrew is the word panteles. That means uh, completed work. Uh, pen, as you know, is all encompassing. Teles is the word perfect. So he could make them to the greatest perfection. Translated here as uttermost. Um, those who come to God through him, since he lives to make intercession for them. Uh, it's the difference between those who love God and those who don't love God. Those who are used by God, those who are not used by God. And we don't have to be used by God just when we are fivefold. Fivefold is more like an office gifting. But when God can pray through us, it is a reward that we will experience in heaven when we get there. It's like, it's like for that moment you are perfectly one with God in spirit, soul and body. And it is a transformation thing. Uh, let me describe what the uh, after effect of it is like. Uh, you know how when we go to heaven, not everyone has the same shininess, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Just like even among angels, some angels are brighter than the others. Now for us, we see everything as bright. But when we go to heaven and you have the ability to see light in a greater way, you will see some angels are brighter than others. And of course, the brightest of them all is God, Jesus, the Lamb of God. But among saints, you will see some saints as like, sorry for using the word, like candle, some like a torchlight, some like a searchlight, some very bright, right? The secret to that brightness is to become one, to let God pray through us, the Lamb of God. That means the light of the Lamb of God becomes permanently a part of us. And that is a powerful reward. And so good question and a powerful answer God has given. That's why he wants to pray through us. Each time he prays through us, some of that Lamb of God light is permanently put into us to shine not just in this life, in the next life and in new heaven, new earth. Thank you for that question. Now, next one. Thank you, Pastor. I'm wondering, if we prayed for the transformation of our mind, which causes us suffering sometimes once prayed, then would it actually be a sign of that you pray that prayer again the next day, we have a troubled mind? It's okay to desire it. Not necessarily to pray, but to desire it. And say, oh God, you know, I'm still facing this, I do desire it and then enter into worship. That's why worship is important, to give thanks to God that you have prayed, and then to put yourself in a holding position to receive. That means neither praying, but in a position of humility, of rest and worship, ready to receive. Having done all, Bible says, stand. Next verse, Hello Pastor, how do I know when the spirit intercession has been imputed inside of me, that I know that I am indeed praying in the third realm as a priestess bride of Christ. Well, it feels differently. For Jesus, sometimes the spirit of prayer comes and he gives out thanks. Like in the prayer over the five loaves and two fishes, he just say, Father, I give thanks. Shoom, it's done. Then Jesus on the cross, he says, 
Father, forgive them. Well, they know not what they've done. Zoom, it came through. So a sentence can release that. But sometimes for Jesus, it is like a burden. And Jesus groan. He began to be troubled. He began to groan. Remember Romans 8 talked about groaning? He began to feel the weight of the prayer. And then when he prayed through finish the groaning, not a single word in understanding, but all the groanings that come forth. And so uh, you can feel it sometimes coming on you through the spirit of praise and thanksgiving. You want to give thanks and worship. Sometimes it feels like a burden uh, laid upon you to pray through. Sometimes you feel like groaning. Sometimes you feel like a strong desire. So just flow with God. There are different types of sensation for different types of intercession. And just yield to that. But definitely, something will be tangibly ignited in your feeling realm. Praise the Lord. Hi, Pastor. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for your message today. And um, I would just like to have also some more clarity on uh, one thing you just, you shared in the beginning because um, you said when you feel like giving up on people, we should go closer to God. And um, that's something, I mean, you spoke to my heart because that's what I was dealing with those weeks. And um, I felt like it's almost then to a point that when you go closer to God, you don't even want to go back to people. <laughs> In the sense, um, yeah, or it came even to a point, and I would just like maybe to ask for your wisdom that um, uh, because you cannot go and withdraw yourself so much to God because otherwise you you just end up living living in the desert and you don't even want to go back to people. <laughs> mm. Um, but yesterday I had like something when I was like um, I felt like vomiting and there was even a voice telling me like hey even if you're in hell it doesn't matter so there was a you know like a voice I feel like they want to push me so much away from people you know and mm. it, of course it frightened me a little bit and I was like oh what's what's going on and so how do you find that balance it's if because if you want to go what I felt when you go closer to God you sometimes you don't want to go back to people you know because you just want to be with God then or go to heaven or whatever. So how do you deal with this actually? We have to have the vertical relationship, which is to God, as well as the horizontal relationship to man. So it forms a cross. And it is like um, a staircase. Every step you take up, you need to widen it on left and right before you can go to the next level up. So understanding the principle of the cross, the cross is both drawn with vertical lines and horizontal lines. That each step up requires you to be on the to build a plateau before you can take the next step. When you understand that principle, you realize that you know we grow by quantums, by measures. Each level of love you grow need to be shared and uh, use to love other people. And we can love other people to praying for them. And so then when you pray horizontally enough, then you complete and you go to the next step. And that is how God built that into us. Firstly, by understanding the principle of growth. That no matter how, if a person has reached, like, say, level 10, they need to build level 10 horizontally. They can spend another 100 years in a cave and they will still be level 10 until they begin to preach the gospel or meet somebody else's needs, care for somebody else, and um, or, or intercede for somebody else, then they build horizontally, and then it's God who lets you know the next level. As you finish building the horizontal level, God will say, next, then you go to 11. And so that is the law of God. Firstly, to know the law of God. Secondly, 
there will always be people who are in need, who need our help. Sometimes it could be a... Uh, uh, God gives two general groups of people. The poor, the orphans, and the widows, three. And so there will always be some poor people to help. There will always be some needy people to help. There will always be some people in need of prayer. So when we begin to operate into that, then it's the horizontal plateau that we're building for stability. You know, people can climb up very fast, but they can fall down very fast where they slip and fall. But when you build a plateau, it's like each step, you can see yourself building the steps. And even you fall down, you still remain on the plateau. So it's a more steady progress in God. And so number two, look for people to release the love of God. If not, pray for God to send you to people whom you can minister to or to help. So those are the uh, answers to that. Number one, understand the doctrine of how we progress. Number two, ask God where horizontally we can bless people or help people. And God will bring them to you. Yes, I have a question. Yes. Um, yes, um, I want to know, because I know that um, intercession is a very powerful place to be spiritually when you're praying for others. You know, some people have, you know, some really powerful demons on them. And when you're interceding, is it anything we have to do specially for protection? Because you know, um, I remember one time I was interceding for um, some someone and, um, you know, they were dealing with a drug issue. And this spirit um, and this person actually came forward and confronted me um, spiritually and um, told me that um, he belonged to me. And I just felt the power of God just come over me um, in the spirit realm on that particular plane. And I stuck my hand out and I was, um, you know, just, you know, um, rebuking it and, and different things. And but that, that only happened um, one other time, a long time ago. But what does that mean? Like, how did that entity know that I was praying for that person? Is it a certain way that we can hide ourselves spiritually? Or do you think God allowed that to happen for me to see what was going on with that person? I mean, these are questions I noticed that sometimes when you pray for people that, that they're doing these things, I mean, I notice as being an intercessor, like sometimes the enemy um, would try to come and attack people with elements and windstorms and different things like that. Um, how could that be avoided spiritually? Claim Luke 10 verse 19. I give you authority to tremble on serpents and scorpions and will all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Claim that one. And also claim Genesis 12, verse 1 and 2. Anyone who curse you, the curse bounces back. And because of Abraham's blessings on you upon themselves. And of course, um, uh, you can also claim uh, 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 James uh, chapter 5. When you resist the devil, the devil flees from you, not you flee from the devil. So these verses gives you immunity and absorb unity. And um, uh, when you are uh, praying for the person, look through them to the eyes of God. Remember this principle. Before anybody is the way they are in the ugliness and the horribleness and in the evil, they were once upon a time an innocent child, a baby. So you could see through the eyes of God and see that the enemy has broken through their life and brought all this evil. Perhaps there's an unforgiveness, a hurt, something. In everyone who is evil, there's a pain in their life. That's why they cause pain to others. And in everyone who is imperfect, doing wrong things, there is a uh, uh, unhealed area in their life that needs to be healed. And so when you pray, you're ministering not to what you see. You're ministering to what is invisible behind the person. How they got that way. And that is true intercession. And you pray for their healing, you pray for the thing, which when that door is closed, 
the enemy also has a leave. So that's true intercession. You don't pray for people in their condition. You pray for people seeing them through the eyes of God to see how from an innocent baby they became so evil and all the blockage in their life that, that can, God can open and God can start doing that. And then pray in the Spirit, you're all right. So uh, those are the two things. You have immunity, see through the eyes of God. And I see there's some questions there. Uh, hello, Pastor. Do I know when the spirit intercession is put inside me? I did answer that. Um, and thank you, Pastor. How do we know when to stop, especially where prayer was in the burden? Uh, there will be a sense of worship released into you when you finish. Thanksgiving and worship. Then you know you have prayed through. And something might occur more than one time because the burden might come on you again. Uh, next one, hello pastor, please pray for me to be healed of this pain in my back. Uh, Frank, it's a simple thing. Right where you are, uh, lift up your hands to the Lord and like you to stand where you are. Standing there, thank you. I release into your spirit the healing anointing of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Be healed. And um, right, I think we have completed everything. And uh, Abraham, any other last final words before we close? Um, I'm thinking a, a, a funny situation. If um, yes. the Lord said uh, enough is enough. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the Lord said enough is and enough. You, <laughs> and you will continue to pray. Ah, uh, what happened? You continue. Somehow you to didn't catch the the Lord's uh, impression. That is enough. Okay. And what happened to the prayers? Ah, they just uh, get absorbed as energy, and uh, probably uh, God will use the energy for good. But there will be a sense of completion. Uh, let me give an example. When I pray for my father's salvation, six months before I actually met him, uh, I was in a seminary. I want to pray. I like couldn't pray. It was like an emptiness. It was like uh, a lot of, a lot of, um, I feel that it's already done. So in the end, I end up giving thanks. So when we are sensitive to the Spirit, we can sense that. So thank you very much, Pastor. And um, anyone has uh, any further questions? Can you hear me? Yes, Jamal. Uh, yes, so I have a few. I was wondering about, um, you, you talked about the prayers. Our prayers are like perfume, right? So yes. I was wondering about the woman with the, with the oil, and it says the fragrance of the oil filled the room. Mm -hmm. does, that yeah. symbolize, does that symbolize the intensity of Jesus' prayer in, in Gethsemane? Yes. Is there any relation to that? Yes. The woman did a prophetic act. Uh, out of love. Remember how Jesus says that the gospel will be preached through every place and uh, what this woman has done will be mentioned. And indeed, uh, it was led by the Spirit and uh, uh, the woman really, really, really loved Jesus and it was Lazarus' sister. According to John, John was the one who identified her because the woman just recorded as a woman, <clears throat> and it was uh, uh, she. She really loved the Lord. Yeah, uh, it was a prophetic act. Answer is yes, and then you got other questions. Yes. So imagine when Jesus died on the cross, pshum, there was a burst of perfume. Uh, hello, Pastor. Hello, yes. Frank, Jesus' uh, name, your back is uh, good and healed. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. So, Pastor, um, in Jesus chasing the demon from the Gadarenians, based, yes. based on what principle did he answer their prayer? Because I always find it a bit strange. 
that the demons may request something from Jesus and uh, he even answered them since they even asked something like he, 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 cho- he chose to sacrifice even the animals in answering the prayer of the demon based on mm-hmm. what he did by what principle. Because sometimes I see we humans at times we pray to God, we sometimes go to struggle, pray full time, all these things. But the demons, they just like ask and then Jesus is granted it to them based on what? Ah, okay. And uh, besides that question, when I read that part, I always say, why God, uh, Jesus definitely is not a member of the RSPCA. <laughs> At that point, <laughs> cruelty to pigs. Oh, there were 3,000 pigs who died that day. And um, was it 2,000? I, I remember they were in the thousands. Uh, I remember it's either three per pick. I counted how many demons, how many pick. I divided them with three per pick, and uh, <clears throat> then um, it is uh, interesting that the pigs all died in whatever manner, and um, uh, Jesus showed me something when I was wondering. I said, "Well, Jesus, you didn't value pigs as much." <laughs> and what I got from the Holy Spirit was that. Uh, unclean animals are lower value uh, even I'm sure they rear them for food uh, for food than the clean animals uh, in terms of uh, Bible principle. Remember the clean unclean animals are health laws and uh, we should not be eating too many unclean animals although some societies uh, the Chinese in particular uh, eat a lot of pig and um, <clears throat> I, I, I tend to uh, want to eat more chicken or clean animals but I still enjoy char stew and pork buns here and there but uh, I make it a point that that, um, that uh, the hungry animal don't eat too much uh, as a health law um, well let me answer the question Jesus saw these evil spirits before they became evil spirits. Uh, these are not fallen angels. Fallen angels is a different group. But evil spirits have some level of pity on them because they want to possess bodies. They lost them and there is a sense that some of them even say, Jesus, why do you come before your time? And these are demons possessing people speaking up. So evil spirits are like pitiful creatures. And when we look at them through human eyes, we just, <coughs> we, we hate them. But Jesus looks through the eyes of the Creator and remember, I made all of you. So that's why Jesus has a different sense. Uh, I do not encourage sympathy for demons or the devil. Please don't take this wrongly. <laughs> some people say, well, should I have sympathy for the devil? And some of you might ask it wrongly in your vocabulary. Should I also love the devil? By God, no. <laughs> Nay. But we are created beings. We should not have nothing to do with such. But for Jesus, the creator part of him looked at them and saw that these are spirits he once created. And for a few moments or seconds of sacrifice of the pigs, they got some level of relief. A few seconds probably. And that's why he granted them. Uh, uh, you know how this person possessed by them was crying and mourning. Not all his cries came from the human that was possessed, but from the evil spirits that were crying and they have no more salvation. And um, uh, even today, Judas Iscariot is in hell. And he's full of remorse. He was in the condition that he died, but nothing can be done. 
And I believe in that case, a strange answer for you here. Jesus looked at them through the eyes of the Creator and some microseconds of pity for them. Okay, Pastor, thank you. So we, we can say that he applied the law of mercy. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and we don't feel like Jesus, so we can never be like him in that manner because we are created being his not. Uh, it's right, your, your mercy is the correct word. Uh, but let me describe Jesus more. What Jesus feel, if I can describe, is a human being crying with tears over something they lose. If Jesus could have cried, if he were human, he would have cried. But he's God at that moment. And so it was Jesus' teardrop, in a sense, when he gave permission. Oh, okay. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. We can never understand what he felt. The feeling of that's why when people are burning in hell, no one knows the pain that the father went through when he sees this happening in his creation. No one knows. Okay, a question coming up. Uh, do you need a power to forgive before you can uh, tarry for the baptism based on John 20-23? And uh, now that's a separate matter. Um, the power to forgive is, you know, it's God who forgives, not us. Because we're sensitive to God, people have got a guilt mentality and condemnation. When we pronounce a freedom over them, it's just like uh, releasing them into the love of God. And so some people feel the need for it to pronounce over their life. And there's a separate authority, different from the baptism spirit, which they were told in other verses. Uh, if it's necessary, Luke would have repeated it. But Luke just mentioned, wait in Jerusalem for the baptism of the spirit. So it was not necessary. It was a different thing altogether. Praise the Lord, we completed today's uh, sermon and continue to meditate upon that. Let's give thanks to God for all that He is. Father, how lovely and how beautiful our Lord Jesus is. Today we get to glimpse a little bit more about what Jesus has done for the universe. We are aware of what He has done for us to save mankind. But we are not aware of what He has done for the universe. Today we appreciate even more the Lamb of God who died and shed His blood for the redemption of this universe. A Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Because that's the Lamb who gives permission to God the Father to intervene in the affairs of mankind in the universe. To the blood of the Lamb, you intervene and you hold back Satan during the Satanic Rebellion. You intervene. Though there were no angels praying to you, for they have not yet learned such skills as we mankind are given. There was no angelic intercessor, because intercession was a doctrine not yet revealed. But yet the Lamb of God released the authority to bind darkness and to draw a line between darkness and light and judge the works of Satan. And then later, you created mankind. And here we are, we learn the skills of God because we are different from the angels. They were no weak angels, but they are weak men. And because we are weak, we understand the laws that govern weakness the angels do not understand. We know what it's like to grow up as a baby, helpless. And yet in our helplessness, we learn desires, truths, prayers, intercessions, things that angels could not learn. 
but they can learn it through us and from us as they bind their lives in working with us. So we were a creation made differently. And we thank you for all that Jesus has done. We bless you. May we grow closer to you today than ever before. May we grow closer to Papa God in heaven. Father, to know you is salvation. To be close to you is the greatest reward we can have in heaven. To have your light shine through us is the greatest gift you can give us for all eternity. Let it be unto us according to your word. In Jesus' name.